much with the scheme to be within the local city council's um, area. But what we're trying to get is a fuller understanding of that and what the impacts of the proposed on-street activities will be in relation to the delivery of bus services on the streets. And then we'll come back with um, our input into the process as a consequence of the impacts on the, the bus service. Okay. You just go back on that. Um, I thought what Gordon was mentioning is the impact that this may have on kind of other areas around the network whereby there may be an impact on their access to the network. I think in the main chair, through the interest. Now just bring Helen in very quickly because I know she's indicating. Just very quickly, I think I need to declare an interest here because of my involvement with the planning committee on the city council, so I've got to leave until this item is concluded if that's okay. Yeah, that's great. Thanks for that, uh, Helen, of course. Um, I think Chair is going to explain that today. if it's coming back to us what's actually going on, that's fine. So you don't understand this. One of the issues we talked about is connectivity between buses being able to be in time with the trains. If I suddenly find that a resident's getting a, a bus that takes them near to uh, Central Station, that bus stop not going to be there because it reaches it. Then why didn't I know about it if I'm asking? Well, I'll tell them I don't know everything, but I'm not close to it. But I think perhaps this point is a, a wider point, it's a very, very valid one because it's similar to the kind of uh, practical experience Steve was relating to earlier on, that absolutely a bus service, like any transport service, is a key part of social amenity. People don't jump on the bus because they just want to ride around on it. They use it as a means of getting from A to B. It's about getting to work and job opportunities, going to school. It's about going to kind of leisure opportunities, seeing family and friends frankly living their lives in the way that they want to. And if you haven't got that there, or it's not in um, the best possible uh, service provision, then that does have impacts, doesn't it? And I think it's you know, the point Patrick's making is making sure how we kind of understand that and how we react to that, both in service provision, but also if there's a planning application, how we kind of reflect that service provision can match that requirement. So, uh, well, I've got Margie first, and then if I bring yourself back in, Margie. My question is just about isolation and um, consultation with, with uh, transport users. Arriva apparently in our area changed the timetables, and I got a number of staff from Alder Hay Hospital conveying to me that they have got no bus to get them to work early in the morning now. Do we know which uh, service number we're talking about, Mark? The nine. Number nine, okay. Because obviously we need to understand that because we've got a commitment through the bus alliance that Arriva Stagecoach and other bus companies, if they're making a significant change and if it's the case that a early morning bus has been removed or it's been retimed so significantly that people can't get there on shift early enough, they need to have done some form of, uh, well, they need to have done the agreed consultation process. If they haven't done that, we really need to kind of chase that up to understand what's happened and challenge them back, frankly. Uh, just on the, um, from what I've been told, there was, there have been no sort of consultation over the changes and also no timetable changes on the bus, at the bus stops. Really. So, no people were unaware of it until they actually went out to go to the unacceptable and not good enough. Laura, do we have any intelligence about that? Because I'm, if that's the reality, I'm afraid it's kind of we're going to be raising that at the highest level with the Reba. That's kind of yeah, not in the spirit of partnership that they claim to want to work in. Okay, well, we'll follow that up because that's against the protocol that we so we have Okay. Um, Tony? Thanks, Chair. That's more of a comment. And then, uh, I, I just did a query about our bus numbers, the uh, patch energy on the buses. The report out today in a lot of the press, bus journeys fall by 19 mm -hmm. in, the, in the year. Well, bus journeys are falling. Then obviously the, the model that the bus operators are working on there is not working. And from some of the comments here today, uh, our, our friends from the Conservative Party there, uh, uh, Avon company going bust. It just echoes the fact that public transport.
transport should be in the hands of the public, and the public should take responsibility for it. We've got people asking the officers questions about a private company and how they deliver the services. And the services that they deliver are clearly not good enough. And they're not good enough just pure, pure on the basics of business. If these businesses are, are losing, hemorrhaging 90 million journeys a year, then what right do they have to be in the business? Because if if you look at all our services that we we receive, water, United Utilities, private company, not everybody's satisfied with that. Our housing. When these were in the hands of the public sector, they were delivered and they were delivered responsibly, and there was somebody to answer the question. With the the operations now and the models that they're operating under. It's no good for the public, no good for the public purse. And um, in all honesty, I, I wonder how these companies actually make money. Lord John to respond at all or was that statement of It's just related to our bus numbers than the patronage. How's our patronage in the city region compared to their country? Thank you. 
tends to kind of be trimming and um, replacing the seats, putting more fiber boxes where they're needed, um, replacing USB charging points, and hand poles, hand rails, those sorts of things, and also replacing the carpets and internal signage. Those tend to be the sound things that we've learned. That's, that's useful to know. It's disappointing, I have to say, because we've always been very clear about how we believe audiovisual equipment should be becoming standard, not merely from an accessibility issue, but from a good customer service perspective. I'll just give you a kind of whimsical example. I was on 79 this morning because of the weather. All the windows were frosted up. I know the route. How the hell do I know where I get to the end point? Um, and that's even before you think about those people that might be a first-time user who don't know the route. So it needs to be a standard thing, and I think we need to make sure we're raising that with kind of um, the operators that particularly when you're buying brand new, no excuse. When you refer them, you should do it as well. And transforming cities funding, which is taxpayers' money, shouldn't be being used to pay for that. The operators should be paying for that because it's their asset, it's their plan. <laughs> so we'll make sure that we raise that in a strong fashion accordingly. Okay, if there's no further questions or comments, if I can move the recommendations of paragraph two of the report, if that's agreed. Excellent. And then moving on to our um, last item uh, is, yeah, we will just get uh, Helen Thompson back in because she's on her, her way back now. Uh, we're now moving on to our um, final um, substantive item, item seven, which is uh, public questions. We have received uh, a couple, so if I can invite Mr. Uh, Wayne to come and ask his questions.